and welcome to another episode of So Fly. It is uh, the end of January. We're back in the studio, and uh, we're recording another episode. Uh, my name is Mitch. We've got Aldo here. Hey, guys. And uh, we've got Gab. Hey, what's up? And uh, we're interviewing a very special guest today. Um, we're very excited to have him on the show. Uh, we're all huge fans of the page and the work and the videos. Um, we're very excited to have on Jared from Flylords. Jared, how's it going? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, where are you? Uh, where are we talking to you from, Jared? Uh, so right now I'm uh, about 40 minutes outside of New York City in a town called uh, Nyack, New York. Cool. Oh, right on. Um, I was uh, <clears throat> obviously lurking your Instagram, and I saw that you bagged a pretty sweet steelhead recently in upstate New York. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, we were up there uh, a couple weeks ago, and um, got into some really good uh, some good steelhead fishing. We were up there with uh, a lodge called Tailwater Lodge, and uh, they they had us up to do some uh, some video and, and photo work uh, for the lodge up there. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah, New York's wicked. I mean, although and I used to fish upstate a lot uh, back in the day. It's such a nice area. Like in around Placid and Malone. Yeah, some, some beautiful spots up there. Yeah, for sure. Um, cool. Well, before we get into um, questions and stuff like that, I uh, just wanted to say, uh, what are we drinking today, Aldo? Uh, we are drinking a little bit of 40 Creek whiskey. Uh, Mitch made us some old fashions. And Jared, did you get one? <laughs> I did not get one, but I'm drinking some scotch over here. Right on, <laughs> nice. right on, right on. Perfect. Yeah, no, uh, it's cold as hell up here. I got tons of snow. What's the weather like down there for you, Jared? It is uh, frigid as well. It's probably uh, 10 degrees or 9 degrees outside uh, Fahrenheit. I don't know if you guys do Celsius or not. We do. We're weird Canadian Celsius people. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I feel like, like- it's minus 60 up here. That sounds a lot worse. I don't know exactly how much cold it is. Yeah, no, it's cold. It's cold, yeah. Polar vortex yeah. In, in full effect. Uh, yeah, Jared, we're just hoping to get uh, kind of a sense of your fly fishing life. I know our listeners would be super interested in uh, in hearing about, you know, what led you to, you know, get start doing your work with, with fly lords and, and where you're from and kind of like, you know, just a little bit of your history. So is, is New York a home state for you? Uh, I grew up in New Jersey, actually. Okay. And uh, were you always, um, was it always fly fishing or when did you start fly fishing? What made you pick up the fly rod? Sure, sure. I uh, didn't pick up a fly rod until the freshman year, my freshman year of college, uh, which I think was 2012. And uh, yeah, that was the first time I picked it up. I was at school in, in uh, Suwannee, Tennessee. And uh, in school, it was uh, something that, I thought it was kind of cool. It was like the, some of the older upperclassmen were doing it. I joined a fire department and a few of the guys on the fire department were guides up in Alaska. Uh, they took us to a tailwater that was about 30 minutes away from school, essentially catching like 12 inch stock rainbow trout. But that became kind of my, my playground and, and really where I learned uh, how to fly fish um, with some of these guys leading the way. Wow, it's wicked. Yeah, you were firefighting, you said. Yeah, it was uh, uh, at our school, Suwannee. There's uh, a student-run fire department um, that selects uh, six students each year. Uh, and you, you make up a team of 18 kids, and you are all living under the same roof, and you're on call uh, 100-plus hours per week uh, during school. All right, that, that sounds pretty cool. Like, uh, Was that like a, like a wildfire thing, or was that like just a regular like firefighting? We were trained uh, to do pretty much everything. So we were trained in, in uh, uh, wildfires. We were trained in high angle rescue, uh, vehicle extrication, uh, and uh, normal uh, structure fires as well. Oh, that's nuts. Okay, so it was around that time you picked up a fly rod and started getting into the sport. Yeah, it was. It, it really was a good outlet for me to get away from the, the stress of firefighting and the stress of school and we, it was a school of 1600 kids so you would pretty much see everybody every single day and, and it was nice to be able to go and clear clear your thoughts clear your head and, and uh start fly fishing so well, that's cool yeah that my high school was 1600 so that's a pretty small um that's a pretty small college uh what were you what were you studying and what brought you to school 
I was studying uh, natural resources. Oh, sick. Uh, and that was essentially I picked a major where I got to spend the most time outside. Yeah. Um, we did have a few classes, uh, actual like fishery biology uh, courses where we would uh, – electro fish and, and take samples and, and study some of the streams and lakes. So um, obviously that was my favorite class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. It's nothing like studying outside, right? Like... Yeah. So when you got into fly fishing um, and you were, you were out there in the water and casting the rod for the first time, what was it that you would sort of draw, like drew to it? What were you liking the most about fly fishing? I think what I liked the most about it was, the challenge of it. And I mean, the first, I think the first five times I went fly fishing, I didn't catch anything. The first fish I ever caught, I was trying, like getting, you know, whatever I was doing, my line was hanging in the water and I caught the fish by accident. That was the first trout that I ever caught. I wasn't even <laughs> casting or stripping I, or anything. I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was the challenge of it. And then, uh, I think what I mentioned before was just being able to be out there and surround yourself with nature. And, you know, the only thing you, you hear is water. And the only thing you're thinking about is how to catch that fish. So you're not thinking about getting work done. You're not thinking about jobs. What are you going to do after college? You're not thinking about, you know, getting a call in the middle of the night and having to go, you know, a lot of our calls in the fire department were these like, burnt popcorn calls unfortunately <laughs> um but yeah you weren't and, and those were just annoying but yeah you weren't thinking about any of that stuff yeah yeah, yeah that's the benefit like that's i mean that's like a, i've heard a lot of people say the same thing about when they got into fly fishing and why i kept them there like but i mean um no it's true so you're in school you, you're fly fishing what started you down the path to, you know, doing what you're doing now? It was like photography, videography, always a, a passion for yours. Like that, that spark came after probably a year of, of fly lords already existing. And that kind of came from the inspiration that I was getting from other creators in the industry and really just a, uh, a, a need to create our own content, I think. And, and, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's been the last four years, it's been slowly only becoming more and more important. And, and yep. I think the last two and a half years for me, I've, I can't even count the number of days that I've actually been on the water shooting content or behind a screen editing that content, but it's, it's a lot. Yeah, That's yeah. right. Is that your main role? Would you say is, is like kind of editing for fly Lords? Is that what you do the, the bulk of your work? Uh, it's pretty much everything. So I'm shooting majority of the content that you're seeing. I'm, I'm shooting myself and I'm editing it myself. Mm. So you say you do most of, uh, most of the shooting and stuff, but like, uh, um, your team, like how, uh, how, how big is your, is, uh, is your team when you go on a, on an assignment like that? For sure. Yeah. Uh, it really depends on what type of assignment, uh, we're going on. Um, we'll do, I, I've done quite a few trips, uh, solo where, uh, I'll mainly concentrate on stills and I'll do some drone work and I'll do some underwater work and, and then I'll shoot a lot of like behind the scenes on, on the iPhone. Um, and then we all, when we, when we can budget it and, and when uh, certain projects allow for it, um, we bring our, our cinematographer out. His name is Max. Uh, he's a full-time freelance cinematographer who lives in Brooklyn and shoots for, people like Pepsi and Orvis and, and, you know, bigger, bigger companies. Uh, but yeah, when we can, when we can have him out there, uh, it's a two man crew. Uh, and then when we can have a, a three man crew, um, we'll have an assistant camera as well. And that's, you know, I'd love to get to a point where we have big enough budgets where we can bring in even more people than that. Mm -hmm. uh, Don't we all? But we're right? pretty, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we're pretty lean right now. And I, I think, uh, you know, we do a good job for how lean we are. Oh yeah, for sure. It's amazing. So for uh, so for our listeners at home, if we uh, just backed up because like you're like uh, sounds like you do pretty much everything. Uh, you went to school for uh, you know like um, uh, natural resources. You did some firefighting in college. You shoot now. You're a fly fisher. 
Um, where, so how, and you mentioned that Fly Lords had been around for like a little while uh, before you joined. Was that what it was? No. So, so I guess, you know, in the, in the, in the Fly Lords infancy, we were more of a platform sharing other people's stories and sharing other people's content. And then, you know, it really, and that was probably freshman going into sophomore year of college and then, gotcha. Gotcha. you know, junior, junior year into senior year. And then the last two years, uh, it's, we've had obviously a much bigger focus on, on creating our own content. So right. that, that was what I was referring to. Okay. So when you say you, it was you and, uh, like, uh, how many other people, was it just you and like a buddy doing this? Uh, I've, I've had a, uh, you know, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, we've right now we're, we're at a team of probably 10 people, um, all working on this thing, uh, okay. and everybody in a different capacity, uh, in the beginning it was, it was, you know, obviously in the very beginning it was just me. Uh, and then there's always been people who are passionate about what the stories we've been telling and, and have gotten involved and, and really wanted to help out. Okay, yeah, because that's the thing. Like, we look at Fly Lords and it's like, man, you guys have an insane following. You're putting out tons of content. I was like, uh, there must be more than just a couple of people putting this stuff together. And, like, how did this puzzle come to be? So you founded Fly Lords. How long ago was that? Uh, so that was my freshman year of college. Until so 2012. About... Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, so and at that time, your your need was just essentially like, look, there's this like, I love fly fishing. Let's just start. Let's, let me just start putting stuff on to social media and just seeing what happens. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in a sense, that's that's what it was. I think uh, Instagram had just kind of started taking off at that time, mm -hmm. and that was we just took advantage of that platform, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a good it was a good time to be there, and and we kind of just doubled down and put all of our marbles into sharing stories uh, through Instagram, through Facebook, through social. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. And then yeah, it, it's basically taken taken kind of life as its own. Uh, you know, with your website, like fly, like the the mag, like the magazine, you know, flylordsmag dot com or whatever. There's a ton of awesome content and stories on there, which is great. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Good job. Wicked job. Yeah, yeah. Some of the photos on your feed is like are crazy. Like that permit in the surf, like through the wave. Like, oh my god. I'm um, so. I, I'm very excited to see bounce. Very excited to see bounce. That, yeah. That film looks awesome. <laughs> Are you guys sure. like a uh, uh, screening in any uh, uh, festivals like the, this year or? So unfortunately, we don't have any feature films this year. We we uh, we helped produce uh, one film that's in uh, F three T that's called uh, The Return, and it's about um, the return of these cutthroat trout uh, into. Uh, throughout Yellowstone uh, National Park. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a really cool story, uh, conservation driven story uh, with Trout Unlimited. So, so we helped produce that, but um, that wasn't one of our original films. We, we do have quite a few films coming out uh, this year. Uh, unfortunately, nothing really featured uh, in any of the film tours. Oh, that sounds right. Like, yeah, um, the the cut short of Yellowstone, like uh, that's exactly where we were, like Aldo and I, right? like uh, shooting in November, last November. It's an awesome country awesome. there. Yeah, it was the uh, Gab caught his first uh, cutthroat this year in in uh, uh, on the Yellowstone, which was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Was was that in the same trip that you guys? Uh, the video that I mentioned to you uh, over Instagram. Yeah, it was. Uh, for, what what was the girl's name that you featured? Uh, Cl Chloe Nostrand. Chloe. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed uh, the work you guys did there. I, I think uh, there was just something very natural about the way that that was shot and and really i was a big fan of her yeah uh, yeah yeah <laughs> it's it's easy to have like a, a good film when when uh, you have a subject like that right like it just it just comes together almost like in itself yeah. totally yeah, yeah just her her passion for the sport was just like it was refreshing i think from not that a lot of the stuff we see is fake but it definitely feels like it's more planned out and scripted and yeah um, that that felt really uh, natural i promise so there was work. no scare script yeah. <laughs> I, pro I promise there was no <laughs> script um yeah no chloe was it was you know we it was a it, much like yourself like we connected through instagram and and then she was kind enough to invite us down and 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 put us up at her place and uh and yeah i think we got a really special story you know we came there and she they were they were also passionate about you know first you know 
protecting the brown trout that are on the reds, but also just so stoked about, like you said, the the return of the return of the the Yellowstone cutthroat, which is, you know, such a fragile. Is fragile the right word? Spe- special looking, like it's a it's a special trout. It's kind of like the, our brook trout here and our aurora trout, you know, in northern Ontario. It's they they're very obviously, you know, a, a special thing, you know. Not that the Browns are. <laughs> yeah, no, you you're you're spot on with that. They're they're definitely a special fish and and uh I think when if you when you guys do get a chance to see uh F3T or some of the when they release some of those films uh the the people who the producers of that is KGB Productions. I should have mentioned them before. Um, but they did a really nice job telling that story and, and it it's one of those conservation stories that ends on a positive note. I think there's a lot um, these days that end on negative notes, but uh, it's, it's it was refreshing to see that that population of fish um, is doing really well. What, what's been your favorite project so far? What's been our, fav- our like, what favorite? Was like, what was like was was like a standout project for like 2018, or like maybe what was a great project that like you saw you learned a lot from, or like that was like a pivotal moment in in the in the building of 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 you know like the Fly Lord brand. That's a good question. Um, I think the first time we ever, there's definitely been a few moments um, and, and a few opportunities that we're very grateful for. Um, our first kind of sponsor or opportunity to work with any brand was uh, was Scientific Anglers. Nice, yeah. Um, so that was teaming up with them. I think that was like 20, over 20 months ago um, that we, uh, started working with them. They were kind of our fir- the first company that really liked what we were doing and, and wanted to support us. Um, so that was definitely a, a pivotal moment. Um, we got to work. I, I worked with the actual fly fishing film tour. So I traveled uh, three months around the country, 16,000 miles. Um, I got Whoa. to meet a bunch of, uh, you know, amazing people in the industry. And, and that definitely, uh, having that experience was, was another um, awesome moment. So those were kind of early on, but those those were you know definitely two that come to mind first. Man, it's like it's amazing that that kind of like um, industry exists in the U.S. Like you say, like you travel all over the country, you met all these different people in fly fishing. Like we hear about that happening in the U.S. and we're up here in Ontario. Like, I mean, we like pretty much know everybody that fly fishes in Ontario. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's funny. That's funny. There's a, there's a lot of good stuff in in Canada though. We we oh, had for a, sure. We worked with, we worked with the fishing BC guys uh, a few a few months ago and and uh, got to see a few different places. Yeah, yeah. Canada's got tons of fly fishing opportunities. I mean, it's huge up here. It's just like there's something about the U.S. Like we look at fly lords and we see like the stuff you guys are doing down there and all the different places you're going and it's just like there's such a culture for it down there, you know. And I think uh, Gab and Aldo going to Montana in November too. You really see that fly fishing is just so it's like ingrained in certain places around the U.S. You know. Yeah, for sure. Whereabouts? So, I mean, this is probably a difficult question to answer, and this is just kind of—I'm just really curious. But throughout your travels in the U.S., where where are some of like the best places you've gone, like in terms of fishing? Like, what were some? What are some of the places you love the most in the U.S.? I've had some really great times uh, down in the Florida Keys. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Aldo loves the good... Keys. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very special place. Uh, the the culture down there, and the the guides, the um, everything's just, I, I don't know it has, it's, it has kind of its own aura. Um, so yeah, key, love the keys. Uh, uh, Colorado is, is amazing. I have a good friend that lives, um, uh, right near Aspen, Colorado. Uh, it's in a place called, uh, basalt. Yeah. I've, and, I've, um, I've fished basalt. You've, yeah. You've fished there before. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's where the, like the legendary frying pans there, the roaring fork, the Colorado, you kind of have these three, I think they're all gold medal trout streams. Uh, I, I don't know the specifics, but out there that, you know, having that title, I know is a big deal. Um, so yeah, that's another amazing place that I, that I loved. Um, up in uh, Bend, Oregon also, I had one of my favorite days uh, ever fishing was on a river called the Metolius River, and we caught a uh, bull trout and then this, like, beautiful red band rainbow trout um, all in the same day. So that that stands out also. That's rad, yeah. I mean, all those places sound amazing. and I know Aldo's been to some of them there. I got to fish uh, in and around uh, the Shady Cove, like around Medford on the Rogue 
in Oregon. Oregon's a cool place. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, we 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 only had one day. That was on the film tour trip. So we we oh, okay. literally had one one day up there. And uh, but yeah, I've heard really great things about the Rogue River. Yeah, it was a it was a cool place. Like we like I was fishing for steelhead, but then I also got to fish the the like the it ends at a, the dam, and then the da- there's like two dams. One's gig one's gigantic, and one's not so not so big with a fish hatchery, and then. In between, there's a that that the larger dam and the fish hatchery. There's a there's a mile of river where they put like broodstock fish, and they call it like the Miracle Mile or something like that. The Holy Water, I think they call it, and it's just packed with humongous rainbows. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was pretty cool. And then you have you know wild steelhead coming up the rogue, uh, that kind of like the end of their journey is where that fish hatchery is. Um, and uh, but anyway, yeah, it's a special place. Oregon was a special place, and uh, I'm with you on. Colorado and we had uh you know we were lucky enough to have John Girak on the show and and he's fishing those waters and I I I left Colorado I think I, you know you know you're going to like a place like Montana like I knew I was already pre predisposed to like that place I didn't realize how much I was going to like Colorado Yeah Colorado's a, a cool spot what, what um what were you doing with the F3T like what was your role on the like while you were touring around just like promoting So yeah that was that was kind of like road crew oh. um we set up, we set up the booths at all the shows. We took the tickets. We packed everything up. We drove this coaster truck around the country, and we were kind of just like dirt, dirt bags on the road. Sick. <laughs> yeah, the fly fishing roadies. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's a thing. That's an actual thing in the U.S. I don't know if you guys have that in Ontario. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. You're talking to them. <laughs> yeah, it's the three of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Aldo, Aldo sleeps uh, in the back of his Jeep quite often when he guides. But, uh, yep. Yeah. No, nice. That's awesome. Nice. So, um, okay, so just to backtrack a little bit here, um, I mean, like, we're jumping all over because there's so much cool sh- shit that we could talk about, but... Um, so you mentioned that you guys started Fly Lord. You started Fly Lords as a, as a brand to just sort of start a conversation around fly fishing. How did you personally and um, Fly Lords get into filmmaking? So yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I guess what the first the, our first step into filmmaking was uh, my after my junior year of college. Uh, the summer after my junior year. Uh, I got a call from these guys from Geobass or Motive Fishing. I don't, do you guys are you familiar familiar with them? They do trap bomb diaries, also yep. J, Jay Johnson and yeah, those yeah. guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love their stuff. Their the, YouTube channel is yeah, amazing. Awesome. Yeah, Geobass is cool, yeah. and I think Trout Bomb Diaries. I think that mm. was the first fly fishing movie any of us watched. Yeah. yeah. Those those guys were uh, definitely a big inspiration for me, and and. Uh, I I applied to go to be like win this college student trip with Costa and at the time I had started a, a club at my school and that's that's where I applied and I essentially made this YouTube video saying like hey my my life is fly fishing this is who I am this is why I should go um, sitting in my dorm room it's still on YouTube it's pretty funny you know what Jared and, I uh, remember that episode like I've watched it like yeah. You remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you guys went to like, um, uh, like to the Indian Ocean, right? And yep. Yeah, yep. yeah. No, so I remember was, that uh, for sure. Christmas Island, yeah. So for, it was like red bass. It was like the super yeah, yeah. intense. Like, we got to go find the red bass, and and yeah, they were like, "Hey, do you want to come on this trip with us?" And I was like, "They're like, these are the dates." And my and school, co- my senior year of college started uh literally during th- those all those two weeks and uh, i had i remember having to call my teachers and be like hey i'm not going to be here for the first two weeks sorry i'm doing this and uh my statistics teacher at the time was like sorry but we're dropping you like that's unacceptable and i i didn't get a business minor in college because i decided to go on that trip and <laughs> you know that, what? Was, that was a good call man that trip was, was yeah amazing. Dude, that was uh, you know, I think that call kind of sticks with me today and, and with what we do today. But that that was our first kind of, for me, I watched those guys really be storytellers. And they all added a, this u- a unique value to who they are. And, and it really, by me seeing that, I knew, like, why these guys had made it so far. 
Uh, and they're, they're actually working on an animal plant series right now um, that they're keeping pretty uh, up pretty tight in terms of, uh, you know, what they're publicizing it, but it should be coming out here in the next couple months. Oh, no um, but yeah, I learned, learned a lot from those guys. And then the next project I did was uh, right when I graduated, I think the first trip I did was to the Bolivian Amazon with these guys called the Provo Bros. And we filmed a video called Ahesis, A-J-I-S-E-S. Uh, another one that's definitely worth checking out on YouTube uh, about Golden Dorado. Um, but yeah, just like those were probably my first two projects ever. And it was really just learning as much as I could from them. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like uh, amazing experiences. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean like it's, it's not something like you, like you mentioned, like with, with school, like they were like, no, it's, you, you can't really go. It's not something that you can't say no to that. You know, like, no. you're like, oh, I'm going to shoot fly fishing in the Indian ocean. You say yes. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So since starting all that and since kind of, you know, getting taken away on those good learning experiences, I mean, it sounds like you've been to a lot of pretty friggin' amazing places. Like, where's like, uh, where's some, where are a couple of places that really stood out for you? Like, where's your favorite, what's your favorite sort of trip so far? <laughs> I think what I try to answer that with is my favorite trip's always the next trip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know if you guys, you guys will probably say that's a lame answer. <laughs> no, but, no, um, no, no, no. That's, that's probably our answer too. I mean, we just, started traveling to shoot content whether it be photo or vi video or even recording podcasts so we just want to see what else is out there you know there's so many cool little micro com communities all around the world or even around our own province you know it's, it's just kind of fun meeting all these weird people <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's that's that's probably my favorite part and and i think uh one thing i i would say because you know we talk about all these like exotic locations but one thing i would say is we've had just as much fun and gotten just as great stories from going places that are within an hour driving distance. And it, it really comes down to the people that you're spending time with and just exploring, you know, different fisheries and, and meeting new people and trying new foods. And I don't know that for us, like that, that's really what stands out on a trip. It's, it's usually not, Oh my God, that fish was so amazing. It was like, that adventure was really cool because we got to eat this rotten shark or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just as much about the travel as it is about the fishing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And the people in the community, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Was that your first time to kind of like fishing Pulaski? Um, I had fished up there one time for smallmouth bass, mm. um, but that was the first time I got to experience, uh, kind of the anadromous fish and that, that makes that place famous. Yeah. Yeah. It was funny. It's just cause I, it was just kind of serendipitous that we started talking and then I saw you were going there because I, like Mitch said, it was a, it's a, it's a region. We, it's kind of where we cut our teeth fly fishing, despite the fact that we did a lot of warm water fishing in and around the nation's capital, you know, where we got steelheading or trout fishing was, was there for me and Mitch anyway. Yeah, the crazy thing with Pulaski was the um like 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 shoulder to shoulder, chucking giant weights and hooks salmon fishers during the the salmon run, it was just like crazy and and, and on the Salmon River there it was nuts. Like I remember fishing that and just being like, oh my god, that's this... awesome. Yeah, no, it, I think uh, I, I, the lodge I think told me that we worked with not to say this stuff because it was like these numbers would just throw people off from wanting to go there. But I think in like the busiest day of the year there's something like sixteen thousand people and i could be off but i know it's like no, around no. that arc of how many people are literally fishing that river at the same time yeah well, it, it's a, it looked like you were you know you were definitely go on a drift and so you're getting away from the crowds which is it, honestly man it's the same around here like we're in a city of five million people and we have five you know we have three steelhead rivers within half an hour of downtown toronto you know so it gets packed <laughs> it gets packed so um, what is uh, so I guess like what is 2019 looking like for for fly lords? I mean the the year is new. Um, you know you guys are obviously doing your thing, doing amazing stuff. What do you guys have planned that you could talk about for this year? For sure, yeah. Um, it should be a good year. I, I think uh, hopefully this year we'll we'll do a better job with planning stuff out further in advance. It's you'd, you'd be extremely surprised at how many trips we're planning literally within a week or two and, and buying flights and pulling triggers. Um, so 
definitely a goal is to plan stuff out in advance. Um, we're working uh, on a project with, I think I can talk about this, but yeah, yeah. we're working on a project with uh, Sweetwater um, uh, highlighting their new guide beer, um, where 11% of those profits are going to go back to the guides. I think that the guide beer is launching um, sometime in the next few months. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, we are working on a trip. Uh, uh, we're working on a project with Avalon. Um, they run a, a operation in Cuba. Um, that was definitely a place that's been on um, my bucket list for a long time. Uh, kind of going back to the whole culture of these places. I think that's that's right. one place that stands out. Um, so yeah, really excited about that. Um, we're going to do a, a few more. Uh, uh, we're running a, a series with Costa called Behind the Guides, where uh, we we get to meet with the guides, talk to them about their local fisheries, talk to them about some conservation efforts, uh, and and so we're we're going to be able to actually visit a few of the guides this year and and, and do that on a face to face basis and shoot some content, um, which which re we really enjoy um, versus. Uh, over the phone and then them sending pictures. So those those are a few things coming up that we're really looking forward to. That's wicked, man. Uh, would you say Sweetwater is, is is that any connection to like the um, the brewery in in Atlanta and like all of their work with like revitalizing the brown trout fishery down there, or is that a different Sweetwater? No, that's that's the the exact Sweetwater. Uh, okay, sweet, we're... awesome. I've always I I saw I remember watching some of their um I used to be in food and beverage and buy a lot of craft beer for restaurants and uh and th that came up one day and I saw all their all the work that they were doing I was super inspired so that's, that I would selfishly I would love to go down to Atlanta not only fish that water but also like uh, it's definitely a, a really cool model what they've done they've done such some, some great work that's uh, that's exciting that you get to work with them yeah, it's it's cool to see you know a big company like that uh, actually care about the type of stories that we're telling. Um, so it's you know we we love seeing that, and and hopefully that's uh, you know a good sign that they really care about this project a lot, and they and they care about you know really being impactful on the actual guide community. So that's pretty cool to see that. Do they run like um? Do they run like a little bit of a community hub out of the brewery? Like I, I I've like can you find a guide at the brewery? Like, is that the coolest thing ever? <laughs> that would probably be a good idea, but um, I visited the brewery. It's, it's, it's really cool. It's definitely worth stopping by for anybody who, who goes to Atlanta and, and is a fan of their beer. Um, they're super friendly. They have everything that you can taste there and, and do a tour. I don't believe you can actually book trips there, um, but I can recommend that, that they install that. <laughs> buy a six pack and book a half day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. I like it. but yeah no they've done some some amazing work n not only conservation wise but also content wise i think some of the, you know some of the videos they've put out are pretty cool they're pretty cool yeah for sure they're doing a nice job there i know they're uh part of the marketing plan for them is also thing you know some of the more i hate to say more legit guides because I, I i think every guides for the most part i think every guide's legit but definitely people who have more experience, um, you know, time wise on the water. I know they're, they're really trying to pull in some of these uh, more like legendary guides in the industry to, to help uh, with the, with the marketing behind, uh, behind that push. Yeah. Do you, do you, uh, do you like, I, 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 kind of what I want to know right now is do you do any guiding? And um, if so, whereabouts do you guide? Sure. Sure. Uh, yeah. I've never done any guiding. Uh, I, the guiding, only guiding I've done really has been um, taking friends out, or uh, yeah, you know, maybe maybe a couple days here or there where I've, I've filled in uh, at a at a lodge in New Jersey. But um, for the most part, you know, since graduating college, it's been like every every spare moment I've had, it's been uh, in the creative field and and shooting content. Yeah, yeah, no, that's rad. Uh, and then, and then, like you say, meeting all these people. Like, are there any like super badass guides that stand out in your mind? Like, any memories of some really crazy guides that you can uh, remember on your travels? Totally, totally. Every, every guide is unique. You you mm. you spend a day with these people who their life goal was really pursuing their passion. So you you're automatically put into this you know, and you're sitting on a boat with them all day and you're spending time with them. So the, the connections you make with these people who 
are living their passion every day on the water for them. It's like, they're having a great time. Like that's, that's the profession they cho- they chose. Yeah. So every guide has just, you know, very, very rarely will we find somebody who's like grumpy or uninspiring. And I, I don't even think I can think of anybody. Um, what, one person I, I would like to mention is, uh, we did an, we did an interview with her for behind the guides. Her name's Rachel Finn. Um, definitely if anyone's poking around our content, it's definitely worth taking a read. Um, but she is, I think in her fifties and she's just this hardcore red hair fly fishing guide in the Adirondacks that smokes cigars and is just hilarious. And she drinks out of her, uh, flask and, and she's just hardcore and, and so cool. So she Whoa. stands out for, for someone for sure. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean like the, so this idea of behind the guides, I think is like super cool. And, uh, and I, I guess you just proved it right there. Like that, she sounds amazing. She sounds incredible. Yeah. How did you guys end up um, like uh, meeting like all these guides and meeting her, for example, to do this series? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, Instagram's a crazy place also for, and, and I'm sure you yeah. guys have even seen that um, with making your connection with Chloe, but it's, it's amazing how you can connect with people so quickly. And so a lot of our connections do come from there. Um, that was that specific connection came from our relationship with Costa, uh, and sh- she's a Costa pro, and 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 companies like Costa have been, you know, in the industry for so long, and and some of the people that have been working in the industry, uh, who are in charge of their marketing, this guy specifically Peter Vandergriff, um, like he knows who the really legit people are, and and um, so that was where this circumstance came from, but. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many there's so many guys. I can't even imagine how many full time fishing guys there are in the in the country. But I'm sure it's a crazy number. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's crazy. Like, I mean, it's it's just an interesting like dichotomy in a way because it's like, you know, these people are so, um, you know, kind of like reserved and like in their own world. Like you say, they're following their passions and they're just sort of doing this thing that's you know, people might consider relatively niche and and they're just like so. Um, such interesting people, but then they, they, they make their way through to this, to, to, you know, be featured in a fly Lord series or in various content. It's, it's an interesting thing that, that happens in fly fishing, I think. Yeah, we're, I think we're, we're really blessed to be in an, in an industry where there's so much creativity and, and so much positive feedback uh, from people. Yeah, absolutely. And you see that like with fly Lords as well, eh? like, um, like people generally like the, you know, the engagement on Instagram and stuff like that. Um, you know, people are obviously pretty receptive to it. Like there's a, there's a want for this type of stuff. The feedback's been really good, especially as we've, as we, as we started to do more uh, of our original stories and, and doing these trips ourselves, you'd be, you'd be so surprised at how much more engagement, especially people like messaging us back and giving us feedback. Um, we get on those stories than uh, you know, us, maybe somebody writing a story for, for our website. Yeah. Yeah. Like doing it yourself and, and, and having that experience and people are just like down to watch and listen and enjoy. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Cause it's even, even some of the stuff that people write for us, it, it's, you know, a lot of times it is original content that hasn't been shared yet, or these people haven't seen it yet, but there, there's something about that like live element mm-hmm. to the stories that um, we're definitely finding people are enjoying. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Yeah, we're finding that as we as we make more content, with you know people, people are 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 reaching out. I mean, obviously, you make more content, people reach out more. But if we are finding like a lot of really good positivity, where like for a while, I don't know if this was like for you in your communities, but here it seemed like we were always like, is there a community? Like Mitch and I, we grew up in Ottawa. It's a town of less than a million. It's really kind of small. Like, it's a big population, but it's a small. It feels small, and there was only two fly shops in it. And he worked in one, and I worked in the other one. And we didn't meet until two years ago, and that and we were we worked in there in those shops as teenagers, which was like, fuck, a long time ago. It's a long time ago, sixteen years ago. <laughs> like, that's kind of weird, you know. Like, and, and so, but now we're finding that you know the more content we make, the more people we meet, and 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 the the response has been generally pretty positive but it's just kind of cool like 
seeing all these people that we didn't know existed but have been fishing these waters for like you know like you said like decades sometimes with you know in terms of guides and stuff yeah it's it's pretty incredible yeah do you think fly fishing is like so when we talk about i mean now this is me talking from you know my canadian perspective and not fishing in the u.s as much but like we see montana for example is very very popular upstate new york very popular fly fishing are there pockets or is, are you finding like, cause I look at your Instagram followers. I'm like, you guys like have a huge following. People are so engaged. Is fly fishing just like all over the U S and there's really no discrimination when it comes to place. I can tell you that there's more people fly fishing in Colorado than in New Jersey right now. Right. <laughs> but that, that being said, when, when I look at our demographics on our Instagram, the way that I think, something like 80% of our following is in the U S and then when I look at when it breaks down into what states there are, it's showing like 1% in each state. So it, it, I think for, for us, it's definitely not like over, over glaringly, like everybody's in Colorado or Montana. It's, it's pretty dispersed um, throughout the U S for sure. Yeah. No, that's super cool. I mean, we're, we're hoping to make a few trips down to the U S this, this year and, and next, because um, obviously there's tons of great fly fishing down there. And we don't have, uh, well, we don't have the Florida Keys up here. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, I got to bring these. We, I, I was in the Keys in January, and I've got. I really want to bring these guys down there. I think they'd really enjoy it, for sure. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, and another place definitely worth checking out, um, which doesn't it doesn't get a lot of attention is is the Northeast and and the striped bass fishing up there. Mm, uh, true. Off off the beach and and it's probably a, an easier trek for you guys but it's 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 cool i i really like it and it's got its own each of these places throughout the u.s uh has its own vibe to the place it's their its own character it, it might be if when you go to pyramid lake in nevada everybody has tattoos on them and they're and then when you go to the you know northeast and you're striper fishing everybody's wearing like vineyard vines and and I hate to say something like that because I, I, that's so stereotypical, but I'm just saying that each of these different places has their own culture, which is, yeah. which is really cool. It's worth checking out. Yeah, no, no, I, I totally, I think we get hundred uh, percent know what you mean. It's like that. Yeah. I mean, that's just, that's kind of one of the beauties of fly fishing, right? It's all these different sort of like microcultures within like, you know, this crazy culture that we all kind of share. Yeah, for sure. Um, so what's next step for Fly Lords? Like you guys, I think you're mentioning you might be starting a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> is that true? Um, oh, was yeah, that a, was think, that a secret? Was that a secret? Should I not have? I mean, we could edit this no, out. No, no. <laughs> th- there's very little that that for me that's a secret. Um, but uh, yeah, we I I, I see the potential in what podcasts are and and for us it's it's how can we be good storytellers and inspire the next generation that's really what fly lords is yeah and uh, i think podcast is just another way to do it and and there there could be 50 podcasts out there and and i still think there's you know conversations to be had and 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 if people listen and get enjoyment out of out of listening to something and it makes them want to get out on the water or it makes them want to uh, tell their friend to start fly fishing. I guess ultimately that's the goal, and, and I think podcasts are, yep. are something really strong and cool. I mean, when you think about it, like how many radio stations are there or were there for every like little town and little ci- or, or larger city? You know, like there's a lot, there's a lot of stories to tell, and Good. like we, we you know we're coming from Ontario, but you know you're coming from New Jersey, and somebody might be coming from Quebec, or somebody might be coming from Florida, and and they know their like, little micro community even better than we than we might, right? So there's like so many stories to tell. Exactly, yeah. Alrighty, so I think it's time on that show where we ask those five questions that we ask every guest uh, that we have on the show, and they're always the same questions, but I'm like really excited to see what your answers are, because like uh, being in Fly Lords and talking about travel, like Mama Pajama, you've been all over the place. So I think these are going to be really cool. Um, so these are this is the five questions. Mitchie's Fishy's five. You ready? Yes. Excellent. Perfect. Okay, so this they're, first. They're, they're not that serious. <laughs> no, they're not. No, they're not. It's very, it's very, it's very serious. Just wait. Very serious. Uh, okay, so this first question is, what is your favorite fish and why? Uh, I think 
one of my favorite fish. It's tough for me. There's not like one thing that goes way to the top of my top of my head. Um, I think the trigger fish, for some reason, is something that stands out to me because of how difficult they were to catch. Yeah. Um, and they just uh, they they have these big kind of gross crooked teeth that hang out of their mouth and they're yeah. kind of this circular shaped bright thing that that you, you hunt for them on the flats and when they're eating in these it, they're really tide dependent fish so you're, you're side fishing them like right as the water level is really low on like let's say you're on like a pancake flat in, in the salt um right as the water level is just low enough you can see these fish tailing around and when they're eating and they'll eat crabs straight off the coral when, when they're eating that they stick these big vibrant tails out of the water and they're just waving them in your face and so you'll see one like across a flat and you'll be like holy shit there's a trigger fish over there and you got to like move there while they're eating not spook them and then land a crab pattern without them spooking in their zone on the ground so that when they see it they turn they eat it and then it's a whole nother game from there to even like get lucky enough to actually hook one up and land it. But yeah, trigger fish are really cool. Sick. You know what I love about that answer too is like, you know, growing up and like reading about saltwater fishing, you know, it was always like, you know, the big three bonefish, tarp and permit. And then like the more exploring we do as as fly anglers, the more, you know, miles walked on the flats or or miles traveled to different places. It's like now it's GTs everywhere. I, I I didn't know what a GT was when I was twenty, but I was reading saltwater fly fishing magazines, right? But now it's like GTs and trigger fish and all these other awesome species to go after, and it's just so cool how like we're watching our sport evolve before our very eyes, you know? And I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's incredible what uh, I think what social media and and what just the digital age has done to the sport because it's such a visual sport and and the most visual fish, like the GTs, like eating birds. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. that was insane. <laughs> that, that's like viral content at, at its finest right there. Oh, yeah, totally, 100%. Yeah. yeah, that stuff was nuts, man. That's a great answer, though. Trigger fish is really, really cool. Exactly what I just said. Like, it's just such a unique species, and it's the way you explain them, it's like, oh, my God, I have to go fish trigger fish now. That's... Yeah, they're pretty gnarly looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds insane. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So the second question in uh, Mitchie's Fishies 5 is, if you could fish anywhere in the world right now, or, you know, depending on whatever season is the best, so let's just leave it open, where would you go and why would you go there? Hmm. That's a good question. Especially given that it can be any time of year, <laughs> like and it's, you guys, it like, be yeah, it's just like you guys can you guys go all over the place. So it's like you must have so many different, um, you know, feelings about you know different places, certain times of year. But it's just like, yeah, right now, if you could go anywhere, where would it be? Um, not sorry, not season dependent. <laughs> not season dependent. You can yeah. fish for anything, any time of year, any fish. Right now, let's just say it's like the best time of year to fish that fish. Um, got it. Got you're it. You're in upstate New it. York. So where would you, you go? You're in upstate New York. You kind of relate with us right now that we're under a lot of cold weather. Yeah. Where right now would you love to be? <laughs> yeah. I guess there's like a few fisheries where if you hit it at the perfect time, it could be, and this is pretty much every fishery, but if you hit yeah. it at the perfect time, it's like the most epic thing ever. Um, I think being like in the Keys or in the Marquesas, you know, during just like a worm hatch for tarpon and it's what i don't know if you guys know what the worm hatch is oh you yeah probably do well i do yeah, so, these guys don't but i don't I actually something... i don't so i'd love, <laughs> I'd love to know it, you're, you're literally throwing a worm fly to you know 150 pound tarpon and they're eating it off the surface because this bug ha- i don't know i don't think it's i don't know if it's considered a bug but it's this hatch of all these blood worms or something uh that happens in in the salt water in the in the keys and um yeah if you can time something like that uh i mean you'll have one of the most insane tarpon fishing days ever and and we really still yet to land a, a good sized tarpon we've had a few jump off but that um, sounds yeah so that's good. that's something that comes to mind that's insane that sounds amazing yeah that's yeah. Not, that sounds so good fuck 
<laughs> a blood worm, like a basically a giant blood worm match for uh, for Tarpon. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, okay, so number three, and this one, you know, feel free to uh, to dig deep on this one. I'm sure there's been a lot of good ones, but um, this one is, uh, what is your best or favorite fishing memory? Watching other people enjoy themselves and, and watching them catch their first fish is really the stuff that stands out to me. Yeah. Um, there's only so many, like, trophy photo like fish photos that we get and at this point it's like we're just doing that for content but um probably you know taking my 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 parents are not really into fly fishing so it's something that i found myself but by uh, taking my dad trout fishing for the first time on that uh tailwater in tennessee and, and watching him catch his first trout was just something that stands out to me i love that yeah it's amazing yeah what's the what's the story behind uh behind that uh some ugly casting and and uh, a lucky a lucky hook set and a small little stock rainbow that he was really stoked to to get and and I think he was more stoked to just share the experience with me and then you know connect with me on something that's in, you know encompasses my whole life so yeah yeah oh that's wicked man yeah that's a, those are always the best ones right like you could go to the jungle you could go to you know like these crazy places but it just comes down to just like you know the root passion and love for fly fishing for sure, yeah. So this next one is a little uh, more, perhaps existential. Uh, so this one is, why do you fly fish? Why fly fish at all? You know. My answer to this question would be so much different before I decided to make it a bigger part of my business. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think my answer would still be the same because if I'm actually fly fishing, which I I rarely have time to do as for, for myself, that might sound crazy, but every time we're on the water, it's all about like creating content and, and telling stories. Um, but yeah, I, I would probably circle back to when I have the ability to fish on my own, it's really just, it's for me it, as, as cliche as it might sound, but it's, it, it's that meditation that I think is important for everybody to find in their life, something where they have peace of mind and, and they're not, you know, in front of their phone or they're not worrying about something. It, it really gives you a second to relax. And, and I think, you know, I need to do a lot of searching to, to get more moments like that this year, but that's, that's where, that's what it means to me. Yeah, no, that's great, man. I mean, yeah, exactly. That's I think I think the reason people keep coming back to the river is just because it's sort of their thing to time to just kind of chill and and like you know just I don't know. There's an innate enjoyment to fly fishing in a way, you know, the casting yeah. and everything. It's just it's just so special. Yeah. So we've got one more question left, number five, and this one is, what fly pattern best represents you and why? <laughs> This is kind of like one of my favorites, I think. Like, yeah, I think that's my favorite question. Yeah. It's everyone's favorite, I think. So you got a lot of pressure on you. <laughs> uh, maybe I'd go with like, I- I'm sure after, after your 30-something podcast, I'm sure people, ha- how many people have picked the squirmy wormy? Nobody! Nobody! Oh, so one. It's no, wait, what, really? One has. Colin. No way. Colin. Colin, that's right. Colin picked. So we had one one guest on a, that uh, did pick the squirmy wormy. A competitive fly okay. fisher <laughs> picked the squirmies to represent himself. So. That's well, funny. Dude, that's dude, that's dude, probably uh, the first one that would come to mind for me. Oh, dude, that's great, though. I love I, that. We, uh, we, we, I, this was the first year, like, I seriously fished the squirmy worm. It was my, my best year ever. <laughs> Same. <laughs> like for brown trout. Sorry, for, for browns. Like, we, um, you know, not all season, but particularly uh, early season around here, those kind of patterns really, really work quite effectively. And Gab and I, we spent, like, a really long day on the river during like opening weekend. Yeah, sunrise to sunset basically. Uh, like, yeah, yeah, it, yeah was good. it was a really good day because the squirmy worm just kept landing and hooking fish, <laughs> which was great. You got you got to love it for sure. I I probably caught the most trout on that fly also. So I I hate to say it, but it's that's that's the first fly that comes to mind. Yeah, it's funny. I never really uh, fished worms until actually I went to Colorado. I know we mentioned Colorado before. I, you know, I'd always see like a San Juan worm. I maybe probably always had like a dusty one in the box. 
but I started fishing it pretty, pretty like worm patterns pretty seriously in, in Colorado. Uh, where we're from, in some of the rivers that we fish most, we're not allowed to tandem rig, so it's got to be one fly only. Um, so when I was in Colorado and, you know, upstate New York and stuff like that, getting to tandem rig nymphs um, was huge. And that was the first time I really fished worms. And then when when I came back here, yeah, the scorpion worms just so good. It's just so. It good. just works anywhere, <laughs> whatever, wherever you are. I think it's gonna work. I it's mean, just what doesn't eat a worm? Yeah, I don't know. Tarpon eat worms. <laughs> tarpon eat worms. <laughs> Can you your own nymph a tarpon? <laughs> <laughs> just don't use it three ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, tarpon fishing looks insane. I would love to get out and catch a tarpon. I'm telling you, we gotta go down. Yeah, yeah I've never, that. I've never really done much of a saltwater fly fishing, I'm so telling, like I'm, I'm pretty you. excited about that. Keys, baby. Where, where are you heading next? The next thing we have is um, uh, I will be in uh, Pyramid Lake in, in uh, Reno, Nevada, with uh, with a few of the the Costa guides uh, at the end of February. So that's probably the, the next uh, trip we have planned. Do you have a ladder picked out? <laughs> Honestly, I'm. I'm. Uh, I fished it one other time without a ladder, and and I see the ladder so so often, and uh, I don't have a ladder picked out. But uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm interested to see. I'm interested to see what uh, if we're using ladders or not. And uh, it's the only. It's like I'm aside from the gigantic fish. It's just that's the other image burned in my brain from about Pyramid Lake. Is <laughs> you know what I uh, I was working at the fly shop uh, in Toronto on last Saturday, and I helped a guy that was going to Pyramid Lake, and then he fished from rocks. So you are you you can just walk around if you want. <laughs> you you should be fine even if you don't have a ladder, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I I don't I, I agree with you. Where uh, like when you think of Pyramid Lake, you think of big trout and and you think of those ladders. Like it's pretty iconic. Three five <laughs> days on a ladder that that might get a little bit old. <laughs> <laughs> But those fish are so big, so maybe not. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully we get them. Maybe I'll, we'll probably I'll, I'll recommend they throw a squirmy worm. Yeah, <laughs> you should come up to Ontario, man. Come hang out with uh, Soulfly guys. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Yeah, when, the next time I make it up to Canada, I'll, de I, I'll definitely need to shoot you guys a message and and definitely stay in touch um, for when you come down to the U.S. and if we're ever oh, yeah. um, in the same area code, we'll try to cross paths. And maybe so, we should do upstate New York, or maybe you should t show us striper fishing. Oh my God, stripers, man! I we was... could do that. There's There's a, a tournament called the Cheeky Schoolie Tournament. Tournament is the biggest fly fishing tournament in the, probably the world at this point. Um, but that that could be a really cool event for you guys to come up for. Yeah, that sounds cool. awesome. When's, when's that? It is in a couple of months from now. But just Google uh, Cheeky Schoolie Tournament cool. and um, you'll see it. But that but it's it's definitely. If you guys want to check out that scene, that's the perfect weekend to come. There's there's a ton of uh, schoolies in, which are the smaller striped bass, um, so you're pretty much guaranteed action. And then and then if you get lucky, there's still some big fish around also. Oh, that sounds wicked! Yeah, striped bass is definitely one of those fish too. Like we've always wanted, to, I've always wanted to catch. I mean, I, it's funny because I feel like striped bass has been big in the in the states for quite a bit of a long time, but it, they're kind of making a comeback in Canada. And maybe like five years ago, they they allowed you to fish for them. So right now, it's like the it's like the the new gold gold uh, um what do you call it like, um, not mine the gold rush. It's like the gold rush now. The striper rush. Yeah, the striper rush. <laughs> like in Canada, yeah, you can go to New Brunswick and Quebec, and they're all over the place. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a few stories. Uh, kind of pop up and I, i didn't even realize that you guys had them over there yeah well they were gone for like they were out fish for uh, for so long and then uh, they just they just banned like uh, commercial and sports fishing and then they just came back so strong that now it's just it's a brand new fishery that canada can just enjoy so so we're looking forward to, to get some some striped bass actions awesome. yeah that's awesome yeah um And that's in Quebec too, right? Like, and there's tons yeah, of good yeah, ones yeah. too. Quebec and New Brunswick, and I think New they're Brunswick the biggest well. uh, place for yeah. right, right now. Well, yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. I mean, there is the Bar Fest, right? Like, we have a there's a the Gas Bay has a striped bass festival as well, which yeah, is cool yeah. uh, because, like Gab said, you couldn't for the longest time there were none, and the salmon fishermen hate them, but uh, <laughs> I don't really care. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're e apparently they're eating all the Atlantic salmon, so like the old guys in tweeds are like freaking out. <laughs> I'm down for striped bass. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. 
So Jared, thanks again so much for coming on, man. Like it's been uh, it's been so much fun, and uh, I guess uh, do you do we can we leave you with uh, any words you want to say about Fly Lords for the next year, or anything you want to say about uh, say on the show? Cool. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me on the show, guys. Um, you know, just the goal at our, the goal for us is really just to spread the inspiration and, and try to encourage people to get on the water. And and um, yeah, we have our website. Uh, flylordsmag.com um we publish quite a few stories per week um and and one thing i would like to stress uh is that if anyone has any questions for us about places to go flies to use uh please feel free to send us a message send us an email send us a dm uh we pretty much get back to every single dm that comes into our account um we like to be uh, a resource for you and and we'll point you in the right direction Oh, that's wicked, man. And it's an amazing resource to have. And if you don't follow them already, give them a follow on Instagram because the channel is absolutely amazing and the, the film content's sick. Uh, so thank you so much again for coming on the show, uh, Jared. We can't, we can't thank you enough. It's been really great. Thank you, guys. I hope to uh, talk to you again soon. Absolutely, yes. Thanks so much, Jared, for coming on the show. Uh, it was a great uh, interview. Like, it was a lot of fun to hear about all of the Fly Lord, sto- Fly Lord stories and what they're doing down there. Um, amazing content. Give them a follow if you don't already. I'm sure you already do because they're huge. Uh, but thank you again so much for coming to the show. And I think now um, we're just gonna have a, a little news segment with Gab. Hey, Gab. News. You got some news today. I got some news. There are no fly fishing news today. They are nature news. Oh shit! Cue it up, Mitch. Nature news. All right. Gab. Nature Get news. What's up? G- nature news. Again. Hello. This is your host Gabriel Bizo for the SoFly News. January 2000, no, February 2019. No, it's still January. Yeah, it's true. Oh, wait, well, I guess the episode comes out in February. Yeah, that's February. true. That's why I said that. Oh, sorry, 15th. my bad. I'm sorry. Technically, that's sorry. okay. I'm so that's okay. Sorry, it's February 15th. Yeah, so that's please, all good. Please hit us Hey, up. you guys, are you guys ready to get your mind blown? Yeah, yeah. definitely. With nature Always. news. Always. All right. So, not too long ago, I read it in the Ontario Out of Door magazine. But before that, I read it on the CBC website, which, because of that, you know it's legit. There might be grizzly in Ontario, people. Whoa. Does that not blow your mind, Mitch? My, my, like, honestly, I read that too, and I was like, what? This is crazy. So, Winnisk Park is a uh, <laughs> is a provincial park in... Uh, and uh, I was like, what? Yeah. I in, said, wah 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 I emailed um, the scientist. I cannot say his name right now because I don't have it. But I emailed a sci- I I said my resolution was to get scientists on the podcast. I emailed a scientist to ask about this, which is pretty great, right? <laughs> and I did one better. I just made one up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, just made, I just made a science people. <laughs> no, no, but I um they um they they caught on uh, um, cameras. Yeah. Grizzlies in Winnisk Park, which is in Manitoba, but bordering Ontario. So we can assume that there is a population of grizzly coming from uh, the Hudson Bay area of Nunavut in Ontario now. Shit. Yeah. And there is no photo, but there is a writing of a grizzly bear shot in Polar Bear Provincial Park in the 60s. There is grizzly. In Eastern Canada, people like, you mean like a log? Like somebody was like, I, my name is yeah. Aldo, and I shot a grizzly bear. I think there was a log with a bump on its back, and they shot it like there was a grizzly. That's crazy. Wait, what? Oh no, I thought you meant log like a piece of wood. Like <laughs> no, someone I shot mean- it. Oh, I thought you meant like someone shot a piece of wood and said, "I shot a grizzly." <laughs> oh, yes, I thought that- there's no. a log. Oh. There is yeah, like a ledger. Okay, okay this, this is this is a language barrier. Here. <laughs> Okay, well, the level of crazy is I'm confused at the level of crazy. Somebody, All those somebody, crazy. Sh- somebody shot. According to Gab, yeah. A- according to Gab, a grizzly, a grizzly. Oh no, was shot and killed. Killed. Yeah, killed yeah, yeah. In Polar Bear Provincial Park, which is in the '60s. In the '60s. Wow. But so, so what? There a what, long time ago. What, what so, science is so, saying? So over 60 years ago. <laughs> yeah, but what science is saying is that yeah, there is a uh, ongoing. Um, apparition of grizzly in northern Ontario on the tundra part. Interesting of uh, northern Ontario. 
our only saltwater coast in our province. Shit. Do you want to hear another nature news that I've read about Canada that was discovered in Yukon, people, and in Northern Ontario in the pre- uh, in earlier years? <laughs> hares, snowshoe hares, yeah, eat their own. Really? They are carnivore people. And there's been filming. <laughs> Don't laugh. This is science. It is true. There is, there is camera footage of a hare protecting the carcasses of a lynx for its own good. So, so you're suggesting lynx that eat hares, but when hair when when lynx dies, hares eat them. You're you're suggesting that hares scavenge lynx corpse. Yes, and I would like to precise. I am not suggesting it is on tape. On this tape, is, David. Yeah, s- yeah I, I, um, I can even put it on on our Facebook page. Like, Let's there's there's footage. Really? Yeah, and they eat their own. When another hare dies, and there's a, a live hare close by, he will eat it. Like during the winter? Like during what? the winter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is definitely to um to um uh stop starvation. Yes. Yeah. Not die from starvation, but to get to get uh, um, the fat content that they need. But yeah, your little uh, bunny that you love so much is actually a cannibal and a carnivore. So what you're saying is Monty Python was onto something. They were. <laughs> they were. Yeah, that is true, people. Any fishing news? or I don't. No, <laughs> it's all about nature today. Okay, well, we fish in nature. I mean, well, what's what's kind of cool is we were we you know this summer. Obviously, we've talked ad nauseum about our trip to uh, Hearst, Ontario, because it was just that awesome. Uh, you know, we weren't that far from Polar Bear Provincial Park. That is very true. Yeah, so I mean, shit, some of the bears around there, and we, um, yeah, could the, be grizzlies, I guess, maybe it, it could be or something. So far, the the scientists that has been studying the case say that. Um, Hey everyone! Hey Jude. They do not. They do not venture into the boreal forest Why? because polar bear, uh, because grizzly bear and black bear do not coexist very well. In the Rockies, the grizzly bear are obviously the dominant species. They kill uh, black bear, but okay. um, they say that in Ontario, the black bear population has been like um, uh, existent for so long that they are the dominant species. So the uh, the the grizzly bear would stay kind of the in the um, the tundra area where there's very less uh, very uh, little trees and kind of close to the shore. Gotcha. Very interesting, though. Hey, like we always assume, we always think about grizzlies in the Rocky Mountains and yep. Montana and Alberta, yep. and, and all over Alaska. Yep. But Ontario might have maybe not a viable population, but apparitions. Of sightings, sightings, sightings. That's the right word for grizzly bears. That's really interesting. Mitch, so can that- uh, get armed? <laughs> Just kidding. Don't don't kill them. They're already armed. Um, <laughs> they are probably. Uh, Mitch is not terrified. It terrifies me. I've seen I, a grizzly bear. Not fun. I have uh, never seen a grizzly bear. I yeah, that's freaky, man. I mean, I've never gotta, seen like, one. No. If there is grizzly bear in Ontario, I would love to photograph one one day. I want to be the one that does it. <laughs> Right? Time to go north, man. Yeah. Go north. Polar Bear Provincial Park. I'm saving for a wa- uh, for a hair balloon. Get your butt checks up there. Because flights are so expensive to go up north. Oh, I'm so you're saving gonna, for a hair you're balloon. You're going to go the whole way in a hot air balloon? Yeah. Cool. I'm insane. Yeah, we know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what else you got for the news, baby? Hey, that was it. That was it. That was the two nature facts. news. Nature facts. What was the first one again? Grizzly bear. That was, that was the second one. No, that was no, the first. First one? The, the hares. Oh, right, eating each other. Hares eating each other. being the carnivorous during winter was the second one. Oh. Um, <laughs> please, uh, everybody, just a side caveat. Uh, give this a Google. Make sure you fact-checked. Um, not that I'm saying I don't trust Gab, but, uh, you know, snowshoe hares eating snowshoe hares. Seems I am the voice that. of reason. You can just believe everything I say. You're the voice of something. And Gab, give me a sign-off for Nature News, baby. Come on. This was Nature News with Gab. Uh, Thanks, everyone, for listening. See you guys in 15 days. What? Oh, yeah? Do it again? Hello, this was Gab with (laughs) Nature News Soulfly Edition. (laughs) 
Hello. <laughs> yeah, it's great, man. Uh, <laughs> oh my god. So good. Nature news. That's cool, man. Um, yeah, I mean, changing it up. I like that. Changing Grizzly bears up. up north. I heard about the horseshoe hares eating each other. It's crazy. <laughs> horseshoe hares. <laughs> like they're not just nature news. They're like horseshoe hares. They're not. They're not just like yeah. Or you said horseshoe hair. <laughs> horseshoe, the horseshoe hair, baby. <laughs> that snowshoe. I thought I said snowshoe. Horseshoe no. hair. No, eating horseshoes themselves. eat each other, you know. Yeah, thanks. That was a great Nature News segment. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, man. Thanks and, for um, listening. And you know what? Thanks, Jared, from Fly Lords for coming on. It was a great show. And um, yeah, like I said, everybody give him a follow if you don't already. I'm sure you already do. Amazing content, amazing films, amazing pictures. Everything's just Kick ass on just a hustler, man. Like he's just he's doing it all the time, and he found a way to do it, and it's amazing. And and, and hundreds you, of thousands are following you fishing around the world, flying around the world, getting sick. to tell getting to tell people stories. I mean, that's a great story. That's a really really cool story. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. And uh, everybody out there, thanks for listening. Um, Aldo, where can the good people find us? Uh, well, Mitch, uh, they can find all of our stuff. Is that a snowshoe here? Um. <laughs> What? <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm looking at sheep scream videos. That's a sheep. I've I've heard that before. Yeah, you have. That's a sheep scream video, baby. <laughs> sorry, one second. I gotta see. Oh my god. Yeah. Seventeen million views on YouTube, man. Sheep scream is just absolutely amazing. Oh my god. Come on, man. I showed that to Rob not too long ago. It was like this is not real. I'm like this is real. It's crazy. I mean, we've got this laptop hooked up to our uh, mixer because we. Uh, Called in Fly Lord. So, you know, I figured I'd listen to some sheep screams while all those talking. <laughs> Start trying to wrap up the episode. Our social media. All the where can people find us? Well, Mitch, they can find all of our stuff at sofly.ca. You can find our videos. You can find our podcasts. And we actually have an online store. Uh, we've got some pretty sweet hoodies and a t shirt on there. Uh, so, please, if you guys want to buy our shirts for money, the money goes to us. And we want money. So, thank you. Um, you can also find us at, at the SoFly Crew on Instagram and um, if you have any questions comments or concerns yeah you can you know you can always DM us or you can find us at uh, the soulfly crew at gmail.com we're starting to get some uh, guest suggestions and stuff listen it's a really big community and we do our our best to try and find people to come on the show but if you know someone that's cool and or if you have any feedback like please just let us know and uh, if and uh, you know you can find our podcast on Spotify iTunes and SoundCloud want to rate and comment and give us five stars <laughs> i mean i wouldn't complain anyway this is it uh for aldo uh i want to thank everybody for listening jared thanks for taking the time sounds like you're in between a lot of work so it's nice to you know carve out some time for us and that really appreciate that so thank you jared uh and that's it for me aldo absolutely and uh that's it for me mitch gab hey everyone thanks so much for listening and uh yeah again Peace.